Good morning, everyone. I'm Michael Hanlon with the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings, and I'm honored today to be joined by Mitch Snyder, who's the CEO and president of Bell, as well as part of the broader leadership at Textron, and Congressman Anthony Brown from the 4th District of Maryland. We're here as part of the Brookings Defense Industrial Base uh, Working Group and Project to talk about the future of defense technology, how it fits with national defense strategy, and with a specific focus on vertical lift technologies, helicopters, tilt rotor aircraft, uh, but more generally on military modernization and how this relates to not only the broad national defense strategy, but the Indo-Pacific region, which has some specific interest to us as well. The way we'll proceed, I'll make a couple of remarks to introduce uh, the distinguished gentlemen who are the featured guests today, and then we'll have a conversation amongst ourselves. I'll begin with a question uh, to Mr. Snyder and then to the Congressman, and we'll have a couple of more rounds before we then take questions from the audience. You're welcome to submit them at events at brookings.edu. Again, that's events at brookings.edu. I would also like to, to thank Bell for its support of Brookings. It's been an important member of, of our defense industrial based working group where we bring a lot of voices together from industry, from Congress, from the Department of Defense, from the think tank world with differing views on various issues in defense, but trying to inform and uh, illustrate many of the choices before the nation. And it's in that spirit that we'll discuss things today. Uh, the two gentlemen who are on this panel are remarkable individuals, Mitch Snyder, is an electrical engineer by training with a degree from Kansas State. He has spent a good chunk of his career in defense industry, including with Lockheed Martin, working on the F-16 program there, among other things. But he's now been with Bell for about 16 years. And in that period of time, he's been very important in their program uh, of the B-22 tilt rotor Osprey aircraft, as well as a number of distinguished and pathbreaking defense technologies and again, joins us today in his capacity as president and CEO. Congressman Brown, you really uh, can just look at the number of titles that can be associated with his name and it tells you an amazing story about his career. Uh, we could begin with Esquire. He is a graduate of Harvard Law School and also a JAG, a retired JAG and retired Colonel, another one of his titles from the Army Reserve, where in addition to being a JAG, he was an aviator. He was Delegate Brown in the American Maryland House of Delegates. He was uh, Majority Whip Brown in that same body. He was Lieutenant Governor of Maryland, and now he is Congressman Brown, where he is also Vice Chair of the House Armed Services Committee and an important member of its uh, thinking on various task forces having to do with the future of warfare, but also the well-being of military families and the full panoply of defense issues. So gentlemen, thank you again for joining us today. It's really a, pri a privilege and pleasure. And if I could, Mr. Snyder, I'd like to begin by just asking you to do a little bit of a, of a mini technology deep dive and give us a historical perspective on where we are today with tilt rotor technology. It's come a long ways from the invention of the helicopter uh, in the 1950s in effect, and then through the uh, various improvements in helicopter frames, you know, the Black Hawk being one of the big five army modernization efforts of the Reagan period, many other aircraft have come along since, but with the Osprey and now some of your new technologies, I realize we're at a new threshold in tilt rotor and vertical lift operations. And I wondered if you could just explain a little bit of that to us today, please. No, again, and uh, I'd like to thank the Brookings Institute and Michael uh, for having me. And, uh, and it's an honor to sit here on the, uh, the panel with uh, Congressman Brown. So again, thanks for having me. And you're right, it has been quite a change uh, over the years. And I really believe the Army's focus on moderniz modernization right now has really been uh, driving a another change in requirements. And if you right, if you think through uh, technology changes, uh, the, the air assault mission for the Huey was introduced in the late 50s, right? The helicopter, very near and dear to our hearts, by the way, uh, the Huey. And uh, then, as you mentioned, the Black Hawk introduced in the late 70s. So late 50s, late 70s, you talk about a 20-year iteration of advancement and, and new capabilities uh, for the Army there in terms of vertical lift. And then you talk, it's been 99, 2009, 2019, and, and now we're talking 2029. So you're talking almost 50 years uh, between... Uh, the last major capability upgrade uh, provided in vertical lift to the Army and to where we're at. But as you mentioned, we, we have a great technology here at Bell uh, called the tilt rotor. And, and over the years, the tilt rotor has evolved. And you're right, we did the XV3, uh, we did the XV15, we've done the B22, we've done the 609. So we've had iteration upon iteration of uh, tilt rotor advancements. And today with the, with the B22, 
Um, you know, if you talk to whether it's the combatant commanders or the Marine Corps, it's one of the most in-demand platforms, uh, again, required in theater due to its, its range and speed that it can provide uh, to project that power. So uh, a big change in, in the technology. But what we really wanted to focus on, and this really started um, in 2013 with the Army, uh, with the JMRTD program, the Joint Multi-Role Technology Demonstrator, where we said, hey, we really want to design a tilt rotor specifically to the Army's needs and specifically to the Army Air Assault Mission. And so uh, tremendous partnership and collaboration with the Army. We, we signed that contract in 2013. And, you know, four and a half years later in 2017, uh, we have first flight of the V-280 uh, Valor, which is a completely redesigned tilt rotor based on the 500,000 combat hours or, or excuse me, operational hours that the V-22 has incurred over these years. And a, a, another intense focus on uh, sustainability, reliability, uh, affordability, because again, really a lot of the cost of a platform is designed in. So we really did have a lot of focus there along with the unique characteristics of what an army will do in air assault. And here we are uh, now today and we've flown uh, 200, hours on the on the test platform 150 flights uh, we've demonstrated uh, 305 knots airspeed uh, along with tremendous agility uh, you know we call it level one handing quality this is, this is the acceleration and in pitch roll and roll of the aircraft and hover performance uh, we've even flown the aircraft autonomously it, it took off and uh, flew an entire mission uh, translated from helicopter mode to airplane mode came back flow waypoints and uh, and landed so tremendous in the last few years and what I can say is that was really done and it really demonstrates the partnership with the Army and industry working together how quickly you can you can bring a new capability like that to bear uh, and I think we, the way we did the acquisition was was groundbreaking as well so a lot's been happening and to see that evolve and that new capability come to bear and again we're we're using that to inform the requirements working with the uh, the Army's Futures Command and the CFTs to really inform on the future long-range assault uh, aircraft program so Lots happened with, with our tail rotor over the years, and we're super excited about this, this next level of competition. So if I could follow up with one more question before going to the congressman. And sure. uh, you, you touched on a lot there, and that was great. And, and I like being able to hang on to a couple of sort of big facts that help understand okay. the history. You mentioned 305 knots, which is, I think it's fair to say, roughly twice the speed of a typical traditional helicopter. And so certainly one of the big things that tilt rotor technology brings us is indeed that greater speed in the ability still to do vertical lift, vertical takeoff and landing. I wondered if you could also give any highlights about two other uh, key metrics. One would be cost slash affordability, and the other would be safety. I remember the V-22 went through some serious difficulties and growing pains in the 90s and the question of uh, backwash and a couple of uh, tragic accidents during the uh, period of development. And much of that has apparently now been uh, solved. And the last time I checked out statistics on the V-22 Osprey, it was at least as safe as the other helicopters uh, or the other, I shouldn't say other helicopters, it's a whole different mm -hmm. kettle of fish unto itself, but, but the, at least as safe as any helicopter in the rest of the US military uh, last time I saw. So I wonder if you could speak to safety and affordability, mm -hmm. put this in a little bit of perspective as well, please. Sure. And, and, and as you said, the statistics bear out, right? 500,000 flight hours now. And if you talk to the Marine Corps, they'll tell you it's one of the safest rotorcraft. They, that's how they described it. It's one of the safest rotorcraft that they have in their inventory. Um, it's, it's in huge operational demand. And, and you're right. The safety, the safety numbers bear out. It is now flown not only by the Marine Corps, but it has been flown by the Air Force Special Operations Command. And we have now introduced it to the United States Navy as well as Japan. So, it's gaining the hours, you know, the, the safety record is there. So it has proven out the safety is, it is uh, definitely inherently in the aircraft now and, and it proves out in the facts of the numbers. As far as cost goes and affordability, again, you know, we designed this aircraft now based on all those hours. So we understand tilt rotor. And as I mentioned, you know, we evolved from XB3 to XB15 to V22. So this is another iteration of those designs to really understand where is the cost? How do we design out the cost? Uh, make the aircraft much more reliable than it's been in the previous version. And we also have to design it for the requirements it's going to operate in. You know, a lot of what happened in the, in the previous, uh, you know, conflicts that we've had, we designed it to fly from hard, hard, hard surface to hard surface, and it ended up flighting in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, which 
again, originally the design was not intended to do that. And we did evolve the design as we went through it. But knowing all those facts right now, we can design those uh, systems, for example, inlet barrier filters uh, to make sure we clean the air as you go in. So all the things that drive affordability, maintainability, and reliability have been designed in. And again, we're, we're showing that the price uh, per unit of the aircraft is can be much, much, much lower uh, than we had on the V-22. And as you know, most of the cost is not necessarily in the acquisition, but it's the life cycle and sustainment. And back to the way we've designed the aircraft with uh, the 3D digital thread model, uh, you know, it's set up now to be very maintainable, uh, you know, as far as, uh, you know, changing out engines, changing out different com uh, components on the aircraft. We made it very accessible. We could do that through 3D design, virtual reality, um, augmented reality. We designed the aircraft and we used all that in the maintainability of the aircraft as well. So we've designed it to be affordable up front for acquisition and we've designed it to be affordable over its life cycle. Thank you, extremely helpful. Congressman, if I could go to you, please. And again, thank you for joining us today. It's nice to welcome you to a Brookings event. And I've been a fan for a long time and really wanted to just uh, sh express my gratitude for you joining us and invite you to comment on specifically tilt rotor and vertical lift technology, but also to relate that to how you see where we are at this moment in US military modernization and defense innovation more generally. And then I'll have a follow-up question about the budget environment and some other things in a minute, but we just welcome your broad thoughts to start off, please. Sure, first of all, let me uh, thank uh, you, Michael, for not only uh, hosting today's conversation, but for the insightful and informative coverage uh, and commentary that uh, you've offered on uh, so many different defense matters and issues uh, both during and before your time at Brookings. also want to thank Brookings for hosting today's discussion and giving me an opportunity to participate. And I'm certainly pleased to be present with Mitch Snyder, uh, who I had an opportunity to meet when I uh, visited uh, Fort Worth uh, and uh, uh, the center uh, where the uh, V-280 is uh, being uh, developed. Uh, and uh, Mitch, thanks for inviting me back. And uh, I'm able to be able to put on my flight suit, maybe strap in and, and take it. Uh, I'm really excited about um, future uh, vertical lift and uh, what's being done uh, at Bell. Um, I think not only in addition to uh, range and speed, which is greatly needed, particularly uh, in this, you know, multi-domain uh, battle space, uh, very contested battle space, uh, the thought of getting troops to the right place on time um, in Europe and in the Indo-Pacific uh, with the current uh, rotary wing assets that we have uh, seems nearly impossible. Uh, but with future vertical lift and the speed uh, that will deliver, it's not only speed, it's maneuverability, survivability. It will reduce the logistical footprint required to support that platform, that movement of troops. Uh, and supply. So I'm really excited. I'm also excited uh, about the, the manner in which this is being developed and fielded. And Bell has made a significant uh, investment uh, in the, the research, the development, the design, building on lessons learned from uh, the Osprey and, and, and other platforms uh, and the partnership uh, with uh, particularly the Army as the, as the lead agent here uh, in through requirements to get to the capability that we all desire, I think it's a really good example uh, of a modernization effort. Uh, you know, in terms of modernization broadly, uh, the United States is going to have to prioritize the development of emerging technologies uh, over fielding and maintaining uh, legacy systems. Uh, you know, we've heard a lot about uh, the Army Night Court. Uh, identifying those legacy programs that have um, sort of outlived their usefulness, spending more money to maintain or recapitalize than what we might otherwise be able to uh, put into a more modern technology, technologically advanced system. So it's going to be important that we continue in that effort, not just in the Army, uh, but across all the services. This might require significant changes to the Pentagon's force structure. Uh, our posture, operational plans, and certainly the acquisition system. Uh, but I think that now is the time that we have to conduct a tough 
uh, and fulsome review of these legacy systems and platforms and even missions. Um, I don't think that the Department of Defense should be doing it alone. I think they need to do it uh, in partnership with Congress. Uh, there are 435 members of Congress. Uh, you can be certain that the supply chain uh, for every major program uh, resides somewhere in one of those congressional districts. Members of Congress tend to get territorial, uh, which can interfere with uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, introduction of emerging and new uh, technologies uh, in, uh, in, our, in defense. So I think they're gonna have to work closely with, with Congress and explain that rationale. Uh, but if we're going to win this race for technological advancements, uh, whether it's in these larger platforms and systems, in artificial intelligence, biotechnology, quantum computing, micromechanics, uh, you name it, uh, all of which are the foundation of emerging technologies and our modernization efforts, it's going to require a whole of nation approach. And that means harnessing uh, the ingenuity, uh, the investments, uh, in America's private sector, along with the investments, uh, the experience and the know-how of the public sector. Uh, we, we know that much of the leading research is performed in industry today, uh, and industry needs to be a vital partner uh, in national security. In the 1960s, the federal government provided 65% of research funding. That's down to 20% today. Uh, the DOD receives more than 40% of all federal R&D appropriations, much of which should be invested in basic scientific research. Uh, and to see that increased government investment in basic scientific research complemented by increased cooperation with the private sector to quickly adopt the, the resulting technologies. Uh, partnerships between the federal government and industry are critical to ensure that we have uh, both the emerging technologies pushed out to the war fighters and that uh, we can uh, continue to develop the talent uh, needed uh, in the national security workforce uh, and maintain uh, the United States advantage in R&D, which many would argue and agree uh, is waning and perhaps even slipping uh, to China. Uh, some suggestions to uh, winning uh, this race uh, particularly for artificial intelligence, uh, would be to include AI development in every major defense acquisition program, uh, increasing uh, U.S. investments in foundational science and technology research. Uh, some would suggest we should commit to spending at least 1% of GDP on basic research uh, that is government uh, supported. Uh, so modernization and, and new platforms, emerging technologies, is a direction we're needing to move in. Uh, it's gonna take a rigorous review of legacy uh, platforms and systems, a review of our acquisition systems, changing the culture and the mindset of how we uh, do business, what risk we're willing to accept, what we need to share with the private sector. But I'm really excited and I think Future Vertical Lift uh, is a fine example uh, of how uh, we can modernize uh, our uh, forces. Thank you. If I could now, I'd like to connect this conversation to some of the recent developments in our world and in our country of the last year in particular, everything from COVID-19 to some of the societal churn and racial issues that we faced. I know both of you have thought a lot about this and how it connects to defense, which is not always the most obvious, but is still very important. And if I could begin by sort of more broadly just depicting that new world, you know, I've been struck that with the House Armed Services Committee in particular, Congressman, there's a lot of bipartisan cooperation. And uh, a lot of what you just said echoes or perhaps informed the uh, task force that Seth Moulton and Congressman Banks uh, led in a bipartisan fashion. We were able to uh, showcase about a month ago at Brookings as well with the emphasis on AI, the emphasis on innovation over legacy systems, but also a recognition in a bipartisan way that the defense budget has probably stopped growing for a while, barring some major new development abroad. And certainly COVID would seem to reinforce that by compounding our deficit and debt situation. So when the national defense strategy came out to wide acclaim, Secretary Mattis released it in early 2018, 
uh, there were a lot of people who were saying to implement this properly, including the kind of platforms that you both have been talking about today, would require 3% to 5% annual real growth above and beyond the rate of inflation indefinitely into the future. In other words, a constantly growing defense budget, growing at least as fast as the GDP, probably a little faster. That was what everybody from General Dunford to now General Milley to the National Defense Strategy Commission, including people like Michelle Flournoy, everybody was saying that about two years ago, and nobody is saying that anymore. I, I'm slightly exaggerating, but not by much, because we know the Trump administration's own budget projections released before COVID became a major crisis already anticipated a flattening of the defense budget in the next five years. And we also know the 2021 fiscal year that we've now entered is going to be characterized by the same level of defense spending as 2020 without even a full adjustment for inflation. So how do we protect innovation in this environment? Do we, do people like yourselves uh, think it's realistic to try to get the nation to accept three to 5% real defense budget growth per year? Or do we have to just make tougher choices than we were anticipating a couple of years ago? And, and if it's the latter, can you give an example of where a tough choice, a tough choice or two might, might have to be made? So if I could, maybe I begin with you, Congressman, since that's sort of where policy and budgets meet innovation. Sure. I'm back to you, Mr. Snyder, for the same mm -hmm. question. Sure. And let me just start maybe a little broader and then, and then kind of hone in on that. But, you know, because for starters, I, I'd like to emphasize that every time we talk about the budget, defense, budget, non-defense, I always like to emphasize my firm belief that uh, our entire federal budget should be viewed as a national security budget. Uh, some of the budget items are directly related to the military and others aren't. And it's important that we strike a balance between what we've generally considered domestic spending and priorities and programs and what we traditionally view as national security or foreign policy or military type spend objectives. Um, I think many of us anticipate that the defense spending is likely to decline or at least remain flat in the coming years, as you mentioned, uh, Michael. And I think that's regardless of who wins in November's presidential election. Uh, as you mentioned, the pressures on the economy from the coronavirus, the pandemic, and a growing budget deficit are just too great, I think, to see significant growth uh, if any, in the defense budget. Now, I do believe that uh, if Vice President Biden defeats President Trump, uh, the president's budget request for the Pentagon may be a bit smaller, but I would put an exclamation mark after a bit. I don't think you're going to see that much difference. Uh, the di biggest difference, and, and people have commented on this, is going to be how those dollars are going to be spent. And that's, I think, what your question goes to. And the United States needs to continue to find ways to counter China and Russia. We're going to continue to defend against North Korea and Iran. And we're going to have to continue to deal with the inevitable instability in the Middle East. And to the extent that the budget is driven by these threats and risks to our national security, those haven't diminished, and, and nor will the budget. In fact, they've only intensified. So I think defense spending in a Biden administration uh, is going to compete with other costly national priorities, including health care, uh, repairing this post-pandemic economy, climate change, other domestic priorities that we've heard during the campaign. Uh, Vice President Biden has proposed large investments uh, and projects from infrastructure to energy and education. They're all going to require new federal spending. And the Pentagon is going to have to compete not only with those, uh, but with also the effort to increase funding and attention into rebuilding the State Department and USAID and other non-military foreign policy tools. Um, I think that both the Vice President Biden and President Trump have expressed a desire, although I think the Vice President, President, Vice President Biden seems to be more principled than Trump in doing so, but both have expressed a desire to reduce large U.S. deployments. Uh, to make the investments in modernization, I believe that further spending cuts are likely uh, to occur 
uh, in the reductions in troop numbers and maybe even weapon buys. Um, look at, for example, what the Commandant of the Marine Corps is um, suggesting to sort of look at the footprint going from a heavier to a leaner, more expeditionary force. Uh, the same may be said, uh, not necessarily in terms of leaner and expeditionary, but looking at uh, the formations in the Army and whether we need the same um, large um, force uh, that, uh, that we've seen in the last two years. I don't think Congress or the Pentagon are interested in keeping high personnel numbers, but then cutting their training and maintenance to save money. I think we saw this during the mandatory spending cut phase of the Budget Control Act uh, sequester uh, in 2013, and that led to a decline in military readiness. Uh, we saw an increase uh, in uh, training and operational accidents, long delays in uh, maintenance depots and shipyards. Uh, so yeah, tough, tough choices are gonna have to be made and some of it may be around the size of the force. Uh, the Pentagon is committed to buying new aircraft and ships, ground vehicles, modernizing our uh, nuclear arsenal uh, because many of the systems that they'd be replacing as we all um, uh, acknowledge uh, in the previous round of questions, they're, they're reaching the end of their life. Uh, and canceling these proje projects uh, isn't a realistic option. Uh, but to be certain, no matter, and I'll restate this because I said this before, uh, no matter who wins this election in a few short days, uh, Congress is going to want to be, and I'll say as a member of Congress and someone who represents the American people, we're going to have to have greater visibility on the rationale and the analysis behind the decisions to retire certain weapon systems uh, and, um, and to make the changes in the force structure that's uh, required. Uh, nothing that I said is new, as you mentioned, the National Defense Strategy Commission. I have spoken to this, the Task Force on Future Defense, uh, led by Seth Moulton and Representative Banks has spoken to this as well. So we'll be making some tough choices uh, and um, it's, it's, it's going to be difficult uh, and a challenge regardless of the outcome in November. Thank you. Mr. Snyder, same question over to you and, you know, to place uh, vertical lift and modernization in the broader context of this difficult budgetary and national and strategic environment. Yeah, no, th thank you. And, and I think, you know, it's similar. I'm just echoing kind of what the Congressman said, you know, it's, tough choices are gonna to have to be made. And I think if you look at what we have been doing on future vertical lift um, and really preparing and, and burning down risk on this innovation and having it ready is important. There will be tough decisions made in the budget. At AUSA, you know, they said, hey, people readiness uh, and modernization are there. And actually modernization is our future readiness. Mm -hmm. So we have to, to continue and they are, and they are uh, all, all the conversations we've had, they're actually committed to make those priorities and those tough choices that they're going to have to make to continue with modernization. And if you look at us from an industry perspective, uh, with the JMRTD program, you know, a lot of that was uh, industry funded. Uh, and from our perspective, you know, essentially five sixths of what was done to invest and bring that uh, new capability uh, to show off that, that that's capable of, of meeting those speed and ranges uh, that we discussed earlier. Uh, was was funded by industry to help, you know, get us to the point where we needed to be. And the fact that, uh, like, for example, Secretary McCarthy has said, hey, we're not going to buy PowerPoint anymore. We have to buy a capability that we have flown and demonstrated and, and checked out. And so I think the fact that you've got industry's uh, skin in the game, you know, that we're investing along with it to bring these these capabilities to bear and, and working hand in hand with the government and the government making those tough choices that they're going to have to make. But as we mentioned, you know, the the 50 years from the last major update, and we talked about the great power competition, and we're going to have to do some things to bring these new modern capabilities to bear. And and uh, so, like we said, it's it's a tough choice. Um, I think either administration is is going to make those. The uh, the services have been committed uh, to modernize, so the budget, you know, while malt may be limited, is still there. And uh, I think it's really moving on from some of the legacy programs to the new modern uh, new modern programs to bring the capability that we need. And, and like I said, we in industry are, are supporting and continuing innovating and, and using our R&D to help advance it. Thank you. In the, in the context of COVID 
and everything else that's been going on in the country. I know, Mr. Snyder, that you've done a lot at Bell to try to be responsive, whether it's protecting the health of your workforce, whether it is addressing issues of diversity and inclusiveness in your workforce. I know this has been very much on your mind, and some people might think it's a little bit of a tangent from our main focus on innovation today, but I know that you're both uh, very much of the, of the view that it's not a tangent at all, that it gets to the heart of the strength of our society and our defense industrial base. So I wanted to invite first you, Mr. Snyder, and then the Congressman to speak to that set of questions as well. No, and it is, and, and it is because it's all about people. Um, and as we as a company, we're, we're just a group of people, right? And so when you think about what's going on in the world, and, and I'll, I'll talk about COVID first and then and move to the civil unrest that's occurring. And, and in terms of COVID, you know, um, the government actually helped out a lot in that perspective by naming us an essential business, by helping us be delegated as, hey, we need to be there for you and we need to support the warfighter and the first responders with our capabilities that we have. So by getting that designation was was critical. And, and you said we we start off by saying, first and foremost, we really do want to keep um, our employees safe. Uh, we want to keep the employees safe. We want to stop the spread of the virus into our part uh, for society. And third, we want to deliver our mission uh, to to the warfighter and the first responders and those folks that need our our, our systems. And so we had that mission in mind. Um, we also had a cultural change going on at Bell where we had the ability to communicate directly with our employees. For example, every other week, um, myself and the leadership team, we talked to uh, 400 of our leaders. So uh, there's a direct communication link that's already been established. We have our culture change uh, going on. I have mentioned earlier to the Congressman, we have a strong relationship um, with our unions uh, and our, on our workforce out here. So that, that trust and respect with each other has already been built in. So when COVID hit, um, our promise to keep them safe and, and, uh, and take care of them and have them come to work uh, was important as we entered that phase. Uh, if, we, if you move towards um, the, the civil unrest that was occurring, uh, back to my first point on COVID, the first thing is we care very deeply uh, about our, our uh, employees and our communities in, in which we work, our customers, our nation. And so that caring uh, manifests itself in our, in our value system. And one of our big values, our new, our new values, um, is lift each other up. And what we mean by that is we really want to respect each other for who they are, and we want to uh, encourage each other. Uh, we have a servant leadership philosophy here at Bell, where uh, we ask our folks not to worry about themselves, but worry about folks around them uh, and try and make them successful. And if you make them successful, you will be uplifted and be successful. So with these kind of philosophies and beliefs in the background, um, even when the civil unrest uh, was here, we already had the tools in place. We have employee resource groups, uh, resource groups, which are a representation of all of our, our folks here at Bell, all of us of different experiences and backgrounds. We had that, that communication link. As you mentioned, uh, diversity, inclusion, and belonging is very important uh, to me personally and, and to the company because we're an innovative company, a very creative company. Uh, if you think about our history of, of X1 and you know, breaking the sound barrier with, with Jaeger as far as the first commercial certified helicopter, jetpacks, lunar landing research vehicle, uh, the tilt rotor, we had a very, very innovative uh, company and have an innovative company. You have to have an innovative and diverse culture. We have to have everybody's backgrounds and experiences brought to bear to be uh, very creative. So our differences are our strength. So very much uh, we embrace that. Uh, when, when the civil unrest occurred at that point, we actually brought our employee research group uh, employees in and asked them, you know, what's going on? How are you feeling about what's going on? What we could we do better as a leadership team, as a company to support you through this process? So um, I will tell you that uh, I'm, I'm a very much aspirational leader, so I never believe we get there. Uh, we always got to be uh, evolving. Uh, I want to be a better person tomorrow than I am today. I want our company to be better than, than we are today. Um, so we're on a journey. Uh, they gave us feedback. And I can tell you that the, the trust is built with um, not only listening and lis listening, and I can tell you, we listen with, with empathy and compassion and equity, um, but it's the action that occurs after that where the trust gets built. And so we have continued to take action, we'll take action in our, as our culture develops, uh, but there's always more to do. Uh, and, and honestly, that, that's what's great about uh, what we're doing here in, in our culture transformation. So uh, I can say as we work through COVID and, and civil unrest, um, our employees ever, always came to work. We never missed a day. Uh, at one point, our office workers were out for a period of time, but we had 
really 60% of the workforce was here every day, came to work. We now at this point in September, we have 100% here locally of our workforce back in the office working. Uh, we've been very productive. We've actually grown our revenue this year. Uh, so I think that really, to me, is a testament to our employees and our people that are here. And I couldn't be more proud of them, uh, of what they've done in this environment, and, um, and really want to thank them for what they've done. So uh, it's, it's quite a culture journey. And I do believe it plays into the, to the defense part of this because we are the industrial base. We represent that to um, our nation. And the fact that during these crisis times, um, the relationships and trust was there and we came to work and we supported, we supported the industrial base, we supported our nation. Thank you very much. And Congressman, the same question over to you. I know you have passionate thoughts about this and you did a lot on these sorts of issues, not only in Congress, but in Maryland state government before that. So please, uh, the floor is yours. Sure, and, I, and I'll, I'll end with the diversity and inclusion piece, but let me just briefly comment on, uh, in terms of COVID-19, and the actions that Congress took uh, to support the uh, defense industrial base. Um, you know, we took a number of actions. One is we authorized a higher percentage for advanced payments, trying to get money, resources out to companies, both the large contractors, their uh, supply chain, so they could keep people on payroll, keep production lines going, uh, and not uh, see a, a uh, diminishing um, uh, capability um, uh, in our defense industrial base. Uh, and we also authorized um, our um, uh, defense contractors, probably more important on the service delivery side uh, than uh, the production side, but uh, to uh, pay their employees uh, who are unable uh, to uh, come to the workplace uh, because of closures. Uh, many, many of our partners work in uh, federal buildings alongside uh, DOD military and civilian uh, employees. Uh, and as we've tried to successfully implement physical distancing uh, and the CDC protocols, it required many people uh, to uh, work from home uh, or um, at, at distance from uh, the workplace. Uh, and for some, it meant they wouldn't be able to work um, because the, the ability to work remotely just was not available, but we didn't want them on the workplace. Uh, so we were able to, we did authorize um, uh, the Pentagon uh, to make payments for that payroll, uh, even where people weren't showing up. And from all accounts, uh, whether it's from Mitch, as we just heard, uh, the other conversations I've had with industry leaders, uh, the briefing that we received at Hass from um, uh, Secretary Lord, uh, we've seen few, if any, disruptions uh, in uh, production schedules, in development timelines, uh, in the supply chain delivery. So um, while the pandemic has had a severe, tremendous uh, impact on so many industries and sectors, I think about retail and hospitality, I think about the airline industry, I think about so many small businesses. Uh, when it comes to the defense industrial base, um, uh, we seem to be in pretty good shape. But I wouldn't take that for granted because uh, depending on what metrics you're using, um, you know, some could argue uh, that we're, we're not even, you know, past the midway point uh, in this pandemic, uh, both in terms of time, in terms of the number of cases of infection, uh, and tragically in, ter in terms of the number of deaths that we might see. Um, let, me, let me pivot now to the, the uh, question about diversity and inclusion, and I'll pick up where Mitch uh, left off, and so many people have studied and opined uh, that if you're going to enhance innovation in the workplace, uh, and that's whether innovation is necessary for technological advances or problem solving in uh, any setting, uh, we know that a more diverse and inclusive group or setting or workplace is going to be a much more effective uh, uh, problem solving creative uh, workplace. Um, unfortunately, um, I don't think that we see the kind of diversity and inclusion uh, that we need to see either in the defense industrial base, although I will acknowledge that efforts are underway, um, or uh, at the Department of Defense, particularly uh, on the military side. Uh, so this year, the House Armed Services Committee focused on a number of provisions that we thought, we believe, that if, it, if enacted in the law, uh, will provide some tools to the service components, uh, to the industrial base, to academia, uh, to uh, more diversify uh, and provide for a more inclusive uh, 
workforce, whether it's DOD military and civilian, whether it's defense uh, industrial uh, base. You know, when President Truman um, ordered uh, the desegregation of the armed forces in, in 1948, um, you know, there was a lot of pushback uh, uh, in the military. Um, and in the early 1950s, studies were done then uh, that showed what we know today, which is that uh, it doesn't impact unit cohesion, it enhances effectiveness and readiness, uh, and it enhances innovation and, and, and creativity uh, in the force. Uh, and studies have been shown the same to be true, whether it's, it's, it's a team working in Silicon Valley or in Fort Worth, Texas. When you bring a divergence, a difference, perspectives based on different backgrounds and experiences and cultures, you see things from multiple perspectives and angles, you get better results. So some of the things that we've done, we know that the DOD is the largest um, um, uh, spender of R&D dollars in the federal government. Uh, we also know that our historically black colleges and universities produce about 30% of our engineers, yet as institutions, they receive less than 1% of DOD R&D dollars. Um, in some cases, they may not have the capacity uh, to compete for and, and, and employ those dollars. So this year, uh, we directed the Secretary of Defense to commission a national academy to look at how do we enhance the capacity in our historically black colleges and universities so that they can more successfully compete for uh, research dollars. Uh, and we think that's really important. Uh, on the military side, we've done uh, a number of things, and I won't go through the full litany, uh, but to address this data set. And this is the, this is the stark uh, 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 truth about the lack of diversity and inclusion in the military. 43% of the men and women in uniform come from black and brown communities. That by itself is encouraging. But when you look at the 41 most senior officers, in the Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marines, those four-star generals and admirals, only two are African-American and one is a woman. That's not a model of diversion and inclusion. So we've, we've, we've incorporated, at least in the House version, there are uh, companion provisions, although not identical in the Senate version of, of this year's Defense Authorization Act. And I have implored um, uh, Chairman uh, Smith uh, and Ranking Member Thornberry, as well as Senator Reeves and Inhofe to make sure that the, the, the Defense Authorization Act that comes out of the conference committee gives the Department of Defense the tools they need to create a richer, more diverse and inclusive uh, um, military, which I believe will lead to greater innovation, both among our forces and with the defense industrial base. Fantastic, thank you both for those inspiring answers. I now want to turn to audience Q&A. In some cases, I'm going to merge or combine some of what we're getting. I think there are maybe three broad questions. And let me pose the first. The first gets back to sort of nitty gritty dollars and cents. One, uh, one of our uh, members of the audience wants to understand as well as possible why certain parts of defense industry are actually showing pretty high profit at a time when that, that might be somewhat surprising. And then there's a more nitty gritty question about the R&D tax rule, which allows for full expensing as opposed to amortization, but that may be expiring soon. So one question is about industry profit. One question is about the specific R&D uh, you know, expensing structure within current tax code. And I don't know if either one of you would like to speak to those questions, maybe starting with Mr. Snyder. I think Mitch is probably better suited to answer that uh, a question. He's got the inside bird's eye view on both of those. Yeah. Well, like I said, you know, as you know, we we have uh, uh, we do have our, our research and development dollars that we spend and invest uh, in in our programs, and and of course, a lot of that that R and D we work with the government. We focus it on on our defense base, so that's reinvesting uh, in in an industry of defense. So we do put our R and D there. As far as the profits go, you know, we, you know, we sign long-term contracts, uh, you know, and that's where, you know, you, you sign a contract over five years and the performance. Uh, and I think that's what the, the government looks for is that we perform well and we continue to get cost out of the products. Um, so I think, you know, the, the contracting that the government give us, 
they entice us to do better and, and to get profits. And by the way, when we negotiate the next contract that's based on our performance uh, and in actuals and, and a cost-based system. So we continue to negotiate those the next time around. So uh, I think the system is set up uh, and likely so for us to reduce our costs and continue to provide a high quality product at a low cost value. And as you work through these longer term contracts, uh, the margins fluctuate. Um, but the next time we contract, our, you know, the, the government understands what our cost structure is at that point, and we renego renegotiate, and usually uh, the price for the product goes down, as it should. So I think um, the way the contracts have been set up, they entice us uh, to do well, and, and as we uh, negotiate each contract, um, we adjust it on the cost basis. But our job is, is to provide a great value product for, for the government, and, and at the lowest cost possible, and that's what we do. And, and like I said, the margins fluctuate depending on the timeline of the contracts and, and we're at in that, uh, that performance. Excellent. Uh, Congressman, do you let, want to- Let me just, let, you know, if, if I could just add, you know, a, a kind of a general comment on that, um, you know, whatever policies that we develop uh, in the form of, you know, tax incentives and credits for research and development or otherwise, I, I do believe that, you know, our defense industrial based policy um, it, it does need to incentivize greater investments in R&D by uh, the private sector. Uh, they, they, they have now since eclipsed uh, the government in total R&D. Uh, but as a country, uh, we are slipping behind um, um, many of our competitors. Um, and we also have to incentivize, uh, whether it's through tax, taxes or, or, I mean, no one really wants to talk about grants in this space. Uh, but whatever tools we have available, that greater cooperation uh, uh, and, uh, and investments uh, from commercial and defense firms uh, with government labs and, and research organizations. Uh, but for all of that to be palatable uh, to the taxpayer, uh, the Pentagon with congressional oversight needs to con constantly do a rigorous review are we getting the value? Are we getting the return? If you can give a tax incentive for a dollar and, and get five dollars in return, then one might say, hey, that's a good, a good incentive. But if we're, if we're getting nickels on a dollar of, of tax uh, incentives, then we, we've got to review it. There are a lot of incentives out there, a lot of programs, and I think they require um, you know, continual review uh, for their efficacy, right? Are we getting what we're trying to achieve with these programs? So there's a couple of questions that get back to the issue of defense budget trade-offs. And I realize we're not here today to write an alternative quadrennial defense review or alternative national defense strategy, but there's still some valid questions about just how can we get by and look for savings that protect innovation, protect people and readiness and robust funding there, but still find enough economies that we can cope with a you know, budget trajectory that may wind up leaving us several tens of billions a year, at a, you know, less than we were previously anticipating in the defense budgets of the, let's say the mid 2020s. Because uh, we're not gonna have probably that three to 5% real growth. We're probably gonna have more like 0% uh, plus or minus. And so one of the questions was couched in the old uh, Leninist phrase of, you know, quantity has a quality all its own. And just how much smaller can we make the US military um, and still not get too small? for the era of great power competition. Um, I'll add one last uh, footnote to that, which is I was struck, I think it was last week that Secretary Esper gave a speech at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments about a future Navy, which is not quite as close to home for our discussion today, but I know you folks both think about the Navy as well. And um, you know, I'm a big fan of Secretary Esper, but I was struck that his proposal sort of doubled down on the 355 ship goal which is a much bigger Navy than we have today. And then he said, in fact, I wanna have 500 ships if I'm allowed to count unmanned uh, and other kinds of innovative platforms in addition to the more traditional force structure. I have to say that as much as the ideas sounded good, they did not sound affordable. And so I wondered if, again, I could come back to this question building on the audience interest in this of at, at what point do we, do we have to cut quantity, but how do we make sure we don't cut too much quantity? I mean, for example, one more example, and I'll turn things to you, Mr. Snyder, and then to you, the Congressman. Um, the Army today has 
somewhere around 30 brigade combat teams in the active force and about that same number in the National Guard. Could we cut that number by 10%? Could we cut that number by 20%? Uh, these are the kinds of questions that I think we're going to have to face pretty soon if defense budget trajectories, in fact, stay flat. So I wondered if you wanted to uh, to speak to that set of questions, Mr. Snyder. So, no, I, yeah, I understand. And and I think, you know, of course, that's not my background necessarily is how big the Army should be or not be. Um, really, what I want to do is provide the capabilities that the Army wants to really, you know, be that, that different fighting force and, and have the capabilities. But if you look at, if I go back to future vertical lift, you know, if you have aircraft that uh, can fly at uh, speeds uh, that are twice as fast with twice the range, the question is then how many assets do you need to accomplish a mission within a certain given time frame, right? So if you're moving so many squads, you know, they can go off and look at that. And again, that's up to the, the warfighter to figure that out. But if I can give them capability that's twice the speed, twice the range, or X percent more lethal uh, than they currently have, uh, that definitely tells them that, that they can go calculate that to figure out what their their force size should be to accomplish their mission. So again, from my perspective, it's really I want to provide them with the most capability they can get uh, with the technologies that we can provide that is affordable uh, and reliable that they need. And then really it's up to them to decide the force size they need to accomplish their mission. Great. Thank you. Congressman, over to you. You know, look, let, let me start by acknowledging, I know, uh, um, Michael, you, you spoke to this before about, you know, the defense budget. How do you decide what's, you know, uh, an appropriate um, budget? Uh, and, you know, you can use metrics uh, to argue for or against uh, increasing or decreasing the budget, whether it's, you know, what percent is the DOD, um, you know, percent of GDP and how does that compare historically? What, or what percent of of the federal budget is, uh, is defense and, you know, and you can argue one way or the other. Uh, but, you know, I think, you know, most, most people recognize, but it's very difficult to implement. Uh, and I know that the, the National Defense Strategy Commission spoke to this uh, and they said that, you know, the, the, the force development plan, what the force structure looks like, uh, what our uh, procurement program requires uh, the capabilities that we have to invest in. It requires a very rigorous connecting of the dots, right? Uh, the, the, the DOD's investment or spending strategy has to link our objectives, right? Okay, and that's, you know, um, uh, competing and, 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 and beating, if necessary, uh, you know, China and Russia, uh, to our operational concepts. Right now, it seems to be, you know, we're moving in the direction of multi-domain domain operations. So what capabilities does that take? What do we have? What do we don't have? What's the delta? And then what programs of record do we need? Once you get down to that, I think you can start putting, you can start quantifying dollars. Well, okay, well, this is what it's going to cost. Are we willing to spend that much? If yes, great. If not, what risks are we going to accept or what programs are we either not going to field in terms of new ones, which I would argue against because we've got too many legacy programs, but rather what legacy programs no longer provide the capability that supports our operational concept to achieve our objectives. I'm not saying anything new. People have studied this. They've analyzed it. They've opined on it. They've given multi-day lectures on this. We all know this but we're not doing it. And the Pentagon's got to lead that effort uh, and they've got to include uh, Congress uh, in, uh, that, in that effort. Thank you. So very last question. And now we can take our gaze again internationally. I had mentioned earlier, and I know both of you are interested in the Indo-Pacific theater and the elements of national defense strategy that focused on that hugely important and vast part of the world. We've also had a question in the chat about cooperation with foreign partners. The question was specifically about African partners, but let me broaden beyond to other places where you might be thinking about working with foreign sales or you know, allies that have an interest in new technologies, especially in the vertical lift domain. Mr. Snyder, you mentioned Japan earlier in regards to the V-22, but I wanted to invite you to go beyond one country and one platform and think about the future, whether from the point of view of arms sales or from the point of view of preparing for new military operational concepts for the U.S. Armed Forces in the vast Indo-Pacific. 
and that'll be my last question. So also feel free to wrap up as you see fit, and then we'll go to the congressman. Thank you. Okay. No, thank you. And uh, like you said, it is a vast region. And uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, been working, if I talk about current products, you know, we have been working with, with Japan, but we've also uh, had lots of discussions with, for example, like Indonesia on different platforms they're looking for. They've already, have you seen publicly expressed interest in the, in the V22 tilt rotor, uh, again, because of the large region. And uh, and then Australia, we've had discussions uh, in that region as well. So we've had lots of discussions about new capabilities for military sales uh, in that region, uh, you know, to provide different capability. And when you talk about V22, one thing we, we didn't mention too is uh, besides the tilt rotor being used for, uh, for its military capabilities, it's also been used extensively in those parts of the world for humanitarian relief, uh, whether it was earthquakes, uh, you know, in Nepal or Philippines, uh, with, with uh, you know, the devastation they had at that time. When you have runways knocked out, uh, tilt rotors are the only platforms that could fly long ranges, get in and provide humanitarian relief. So uh, there's a lot of interest, not only for foreign military sales, but for humanitarian relief type uh, services that those kind of capabilities can provide in the region uh, for our allies. And uh, if you leak, you know, think forward now for, for the new platforms in the V280, uh, for example, or a new tilt rotor, new capabilities in that region, uh, it is a true power projection capability. Uh, when you think about the current vertical lift aircraft, it, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you're talking ranges now of uh, you can you can take a squad uh, 500 to 800 nautical miles, depending on the fuel uh, that we, we need aboard the aircraft. It can actually self-deploy 1,700 miles. Uh, you know, if you have a refuel probe, we'll go as long as the pilot wants to set in the seat. So the thing is, is uh, when you look at that vast region out there, um, you know, there's those kind of uh, ranges and speeds uh, are necessary to quickly maneuver combat forces around in the region uh, like the Army. So I think it's very relevant in the region. I think working with our international partners, we've had lots of interest, by the way, uh, on the V280 from international uh, customers that they've seen it fly, come, want to come see it. They actually go to our, our Crystal City Advanced Vertical Lift Center to see and learn more about it. So um, we have lots of, a lot of international interests, and I think we are going to need our allies in that region as well. So the good thing is, is we're working with them currently on, on existing foreign military sales as well as, as our new product lines. So, and again, to wrap it up, you know, uh, Michael, I really appreciate and Brookings Institute to have this opportunity to speak with, with you as well as uh, dialogue with uh, the congressman. Uh, and congressman, I appreciate all your support that you provided to us. Uh, as a defense industrial base. And, and you mentioned earlier, those, those advanced payments and for our ability to keep our supply chain working extremely well during this time was, was very, very much uh, helpful. And, and thank you for providing that. So uh, with that, I'll close my time out and turn it back over to you as well. Thanks, Michael. Super, thank you. And Congressman, for the last word, over to you. Sure, look, the national defense strategy, it, it, it appropriately sets as a priority, great power, competition and conflict primarily with China uh, and Russia, uh, but it also places a great value uh, and necessity on our alliances and partnerships around the world, particularly NATO. Uh, but that's true, not just uh, in Europe with NATO, uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, and in Africa. I've had an opportunity to travel to, to each uh, of those uh, regions. Every time I'm there, I hear a similar uh, a theme from our, our allied partners. And that is that we are their preferred partner. Uh, we are their preferred ally. Uh, and we should not take that uh, for granted. Uh, in Africa, you see China uh, um, uh, making huge investments, uh, establishing military bases uh, in the Indo-Pacific. And, and look, we are just as much a Pacific uh, nation uh, as China is. Um, we see Chinese investments and presence uh, in nations that we consider friends. Um, and in conversations with them, it's not the preferred direction that they want to take. However, over the last several years, uh, in, their, in their view, uh, we don't seem to demonstrate the same commitment to them and the partnerships. We've got to get back to these partnerships. Congress recognizes that. We're the ones that... Um, uh, um, created or established the European, first the European Reassurance Initiative and now the European Deterrence Initiative. We've done the same thing in the Indo-Pacific uh, region uh, and I'm working with my colleagues 
uh, to establish a similar uh, statutory sort of framework for a commitment, and not just military, diplomatic development, humanitarian framework to assist and partner around the world, because that is a big part uh, of uh, the great power competition. Uh, and if we're going to make more investments in modernization, we need to leverage the resources of our partners so that they uh, can in fact make those investments to keep the world safe, this international order that the United States has enjoyed uh, and benefited from in the last 70 years. So uh, as I said, I wanna thank uh, you, uh, Michael, thank Brookings for uh, including me today for the wonderful work that you do, military, domestic issues, you name it, you're a real um, asset uh, to, the, uh, um, to the country. Thank you. Very kind of you both. It was a privilege. Thank you for all you're doing for the country and all the people who work with and for you and all the men and women of the armed forces and their families. Uh, so as we sign off here, uh, wish folks as well a, a good rest of October, happy Halloween, uh, happy election day and best wishes for the future. So with that, we'll be signing off from Brookings. Thank you again and goodbye. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.